Hi, I'm KZ and I'm a natural born cosplayer. I have a couple questions for you. How much money do you spend on clothes? Most people spend about $200 a month on clothing. But what if you lived before all the stuff was automated? How much would you have to spend on clothing then? Really? People were as frugal as they could be. They would buy a dress and then continue to use it. Fix it, repair it, alter it, anything they could to extend the life of that garment because the fabric was the expense. So if you paid a lot of money for the fabric, why would you get rid of it later? My next question, how much work do you put into your clothes? Granted, the audience of this video probably puts in a lot more work than most people do. So it's kind of a trick question, I guess. But that still can depend. Do you make your stuff by hand? Or do you sew it on a machine? It depends, right? But when you didn't have that option, you put a lot more time into it. And now for the big one. How many items of clothing do you have? I'm guilty on this one. I have more stuff to fix than I think most people have, even today. And people today have a lot more clothes than people did historically. People would have, you know, a few dresses or for men, a few coats and breeches. When something, one of these few dresses that you have gets damaged, what do you do about it? You're not going to throw it away, that's for sure. So how would you repair it historically? Let's dig in a little bit. So first off, there is this invisible mending, and that is where you would take threads from a seam of some sort and reweave it into the fabric to allow it to cover up the hole. And this can be done incredibly well, and it can be completely invisible. And these days, with the rise of visible mending, you can use it visibly, which is just plain fun. I really need to do this on some things now that I know about this trick. There is a way where you can hide a hole in knits by stitching along the path that the thread would have gone in the process of knitting the fabric. It yes. Darning is very similar to invisible mending. Both of them are used to fill a hole in the fabric and both of them you use a patch underneath on the wrong side and then the repair happens up on top. But with invisible mending, you're weaving the thread through and then creating more fabric in that space. With darning, you're just kind of stitching over it in order to hold the patch in place. Today, there are many companies that make different materials, different tools, different... I know there's one that's a powder. There's probably other ways, other companies that do it similarly. But you can cut just a clump of fabric, press it in there, and it heat activates and can make it very smooth and look invisible. It's a lot quicker than invisible mending. I also suspect that it's probably not as strong. You, you do use a patch behind in both, but I would be curious to see how long some of these iron-on tricks work. Lest you think that visible mending is a new thing, let's travel to Japan they have an interesting take on repairs. They choose to make their repairs 
beautiful. Kintsugi pottery, they show off. Well, not show off really. They display the wounds and the healing and they make them beautiful. The repair itself is featured, but they didn't just do this type of thing with pottery. If you've ever heard of Sashiko, the origins of that also may come from mending. I couldn't find a definitive beginning of Sashiko because it goes so far back, but it was used in mending as early as can be found. So it's also a way to make something that was damaged into something beautiful, which there's something poetic about that. And that's part of what I love about this um, visible mending movement right now. I think it's a lot of fun. When we think about the history of mending, usually our first association is a patched coat or something like that which we've seen a lot in stories and imagery, things like that, because it can tell a story. These very visible patches tell you something about the person wearing the garment. Finding extant examples of patched clothing is a little different. Oftentimes, historical clothing that has been patched it was done in a way to try to hide it. It wasn't featured. Even in things that use like patches, like patchwork, they did try to hide it. But there's a lot of other ways to hide things. Um, in seams and nips and tucks and, you know, um, I have a coat where the lining has been replaced. and actually it wasn't even replaced it was added on and I need to do another layer of add on. I started trying to patch the lining and I realized what had been done before and I'm like, okay, we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to add a new lining. So sometimes the patches can be more visible than others. Um, this example is it's visible, but it would be in the hem. So it wouldn't be something that would be very glaring, but today's fashions, we have a lot of kind of tricks. If you want to make them visible, by all means, go for it. It's fun. But you can also be more sneaky if you want to. This one is, it shows just this embroidery, which this was designed in in the beginning, but it shows a good example of something that you could do to cover up a hole. This dress has moth holes all along the hem, so I've been doing cut work on my embroidery machine. This Gucci skirt, these pockets, could easily be patches if you needed them to be. I don't know if this is um, an ambition of guilt or not, but Walmart sells patches. I don't know. Make of that what you will. Depending on your character, you can do a lot of different things. This style coat pairs well with patches. I even went a little overboard and did something that totally didn't go with it. And that Superman logo, totally a patch. When you have a historical gown, add a ruffle if the bottom gets damaged. It's easy enough to do, but it's not even a modern trick. That was used at the time too. Think about a dust ruffle that was intended to be what got damaged and protect the outer dress. It's a neat trick and it can go both ways. You can add another ruffle on the outside and add a dust ruffle on the inside to protect it again. A lot of visible mending techniques actually take their inspiration from historical techniques. Ruffles can be used to cover things up, but a ruffle is only the beginning. There's flowers and lace and bows and ribbons. Did I already say ribbons? You can buy a shirt for a thousand, almost $2,000 that looks like you sewed two shirts together. 
This one's another example of how you can just cut away something that's damaged. This one, my friend has the other half of the white shirt and we each had a different black undershirt. So I found similar examples of kind of two-tone clothing where it could be two pieces matched together from Dior and Louis Vuitton and Emilio Pucci and Bottega Venata. And traditionally party coloring is basically the same thing. And uh, Harley Quinn, anyone? This skirt shows a fun way to add length or patch damage. So this suit jacket is vintage, I guess you'd probably say. I don't know exactly how far back, but my guess would be 70s. The gentleman who got this got a lot of English wool. This one says it's made in India. It doesn't say where the wool is from. The hat I bought in the 2000s in Ireland. So they're both very, very similar style and kind of timeless. This is a pair of pants, which I originally had made for my husband as two separate pants. Turns out, you, while you can use just basic rectangles to make a big fluffy pair of belly dance pants like this, it doesn't work so well when you try to scale it down to kind of normal sized pants. So he tore them right across here. There's a few places where you can see I had to patch it back together. So what I did was I took each pair of pants, I cut them into strips, and I reassembled them into a bigger pair of pants. And when you're doing two-tone, it doesn't even have to be the same fabric. If you find something that contrasts really nice, go for it. Montclair shows a good example of um, what was in style a few years ago, inset lace is a really good way to, to just jazz up your clothes and hide, hide holes if you have them. Um, I did find this style interesting. Um, just cut a hole around it and uh, finish the edges of the holes. This isn't just one designer either. I found one of these on several different um, designers, pages, websites. This is another one that's a little different. But you could totally use that. Like, okay, so half of your dress ripped. Cut it off! Thank you, Louis Vuitton. And these cut t-shirts, you can also use kind of history bounding. I took, I opened the front, gathered this over to make a little bit of a peplum on here. This one I kind of like because it shows several different examples of things that you can do that are apparently in style. I don't know. I don't keep up with modern fashion, sorry. Um, it's cut off short, so you have a long shirt that has a hole in it, so you cut it. It works. And it's not even like tightly fitted or anything, it's very loose. I think of this section of the video as a YouTube to-do list for me, because these are fun. This one looks like it has been bleach dyed. Historically, People would make undergarments out of white fabric because it could be bleached easily so that you could get the stains out. But what if you got a stain on colored clothes? Today, people use bleach to decorate their clothes. I mean, how cool is that? There's a lot of different ways that you can apply bleach or dye, either one in this way. Um, spraying, painting, dipping, shibori wrapping. It's kind of a tie-dye technique that's much more ancient, whatever you want to do. And uh, shout out to Morgan Donner because that's just a win. This one's one that my mom did. We do a lot of painting and she got paint on her nice pants. So she did this in the style of her father's block print designs. This one is a coat made by an artist, Taya Shano. This one was actually in the Smithsonian for a little while. It's an entirely hand-painted coat. 
they can be very, very fashionable, very, very detailed, exquisite, however detailed you want to get. They can also be super simple. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. And you can have fun with different textures. This one is a dot paint. Like, you know that puffy fabric paint? Have at it. Like, there's so many ways to make things fun. And a lot of this goes for modern clothes and not so much for historical, unless you're using the paint to replicate something else. Like, the dots could replicate crystals or something else so that, you know, you can have a cheap alternative, I guess. But there are a lot of traditional techniques as well. Block printing comes to mind as a very ancient way to get an image on a garment. Um, this can be as low key as using a potato. Literally, you can carve an image into a potato and use that as a block print. Today, most t-shirts are silk screened, but it's not that hard to do at home either. There's also the old conservatorist technique of if lace gets torn, putting a net behind it, like a tool, maybe something softer depending on the lace, and tacking it together to kind of support the lace that's been damaged. This video was a real struggle for me because how can I tell you how to be creative? You're a creative person. All I can do is give you some ideas. I hope you found these ideas valuable, whether you do historical costumes or cosplay or history bounding or whatever you do. I hope there's something in here that you found valuable. I know for me that going, af going through all of these ideas, I have been so inspired. I am going to go through my massive pile of UFOs and repair things and start working on it. And I'm going to try to make those into some videos. So my next video to come out next month is going to be going through and seeing what needs to be repaired. So just a fun closet tour, I guess. Weird, weird closet tour. I don't know. And thank you for stopping by. I am recommitting myself to making videos on a regular basis. Um, that's been a challenge, but we're going to try again. Um, I have the Cozy video playlist linked below and all of my sources are down there. Um, yeah, subscribe and uh, I hope to see you around. Thanks. Bye. All right. Okay. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm a nap. I'm a. B -b -b My dogs will not stop licking me. Please, please. I want to pet you. I don't want you to lick me. If you want attention, this is not the way to get it. Okay. There. That's right. That's good. Okay. So invisible mending to reweave the fabric. I cannot wear short skirts around these dogs. Licking. Oh my God, the licking. Okay. Um. Words, words escape me. So darning is similar Darning is similar to invisible mending. It's also... <laughs> Darning is very similar to invisible mending. It's also a way to fill a hole. Just like with invisible... <laughs> my chairs are fighting. My dogs are licking. It's just... Yeah.